This is Science, Scripture, and Salvation, a Creation Radio Journal. I'm Chris O'Brien with the Institute for Creation Research. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Throughout our school years, most of us were taught that the adventurous Christopher Columbus wanted to sail around the earth to prove to the world that it was round. But the misconception that most people in the 15th century thought the earth was flat was actually made up in 1830. This myth is being used against creationists. But how? Sail away with us for the next 15 minutes as we discover the facts about Columbus and the flat earth myth. Dr. Danny Faulkner is professor of astronomy at the University of South Carolina at Lancaster. I think all of us were victims, if you were, for the education establishment growing up. We were generally taught that everybody thought the world was flat until just a few centuries ago and that you had a few visionaries such as Christopher Columbus who wanted to prove the world was spherical. And the story goes that the religious people opposed them because they thought the Bible taught the world was flat. And then on top of all that, sometimes critics of creationists will accuse we creationists of trying to introduce a flat earth sort of concept. And the irony is, is that they've got it completely backwards. The fact of the matter is that the scholars in Columbus's day weren't arguing over the shape of the earth, but rather the size of it. ICR biology researcher John Rica explains. Perhaps the greatest part of this myth is that Columbus believed the earth was round and the church at the time believed the earth was flat. The truth is, all people believed that the earth was round at the time of Columbus. The big question at the time in the Inquisitor's Court and what Columbus had to make his case for was how far was it if you sailed the Atlantic to Cathay or China? Columbus said it was a certain distance. The best scholarship at the time said it was a lot more. The bottom line, Columbus was wrong. The other scholars were right. What nobody realized is there was a landmass in between. Columbus did some interesting figuring to try and close the gap between Spain and China. For instance, there were two estimates of that time of the nature of the earth, how far apart the ocean was at the time. Eratosthenes said it was 250,000 stades, uh, about 40,000 kilometers, whereas Ptolemy said, no, no, it was only 180,000. Columbus chose the 180,000. Dr. Faulkner. What's very fascinating, in around 200 B.C., a man named Eratosthenes, he was a Greek living in Alexandria, Egypt, also the father of geography. He was able to measure the size of the earth to within about a half percent of the correct value. And he did this 22 centuries ago. The big argument with Columbus was not over the shape of the earth, but over the size of the earth. Everyone agreed you could get to the Orient by sailing westward from Europe. But why would you want to? It was much farther that way and much more dangerous because they thought it was open ocean. And so actually, if you examine it, you'll find that Christopher Columbus was wrong. He really thought that Asia was not too far westward of Europe. And what he reality ran into, of course, was the North American, South American continents. So just how did such a story that people believed the Earth was flat get started in the first place? ICR geologist Bill Hoche says it didn't come from any of the well-known scientists or philosophers of ancient history. You can go back to the 6th century B.C. and Pythagoras stated emphatically the Earth is spherical. So did Aristotle, so did Euclid. In fact, you could find very few dissenters of this idea in classical Greece. The situation changed very little with the advent of Christianity. Oh, you can find a few no-names back then of people who used certain verses in the Bible to try to state that the earth was flat. Extremely rare, though. Uh, belief in a spherical earth was essentially universal. So where did the idea begin? It wasn't with Galileo. It was no issue with him. It was no issue with Copernicus. No one before the 1830s thought the earth was flat. It was in the 1830s, a Frenchman named Latron, who was a fellow with strong anti-religious prejudice, and Washington Irving, the American literary giant who gave us Rip Van Winkle and other popular accounts, Washington Irving wrote his book in 1828 on Columbus. Now, he wrote it tongue-in-cheek, knowing it was largely fiction, but it got picked up. Sadly, the myth that people used to believe the world was flat was actually started with the purpose of making people who believe in God look ignorant. 
Clearly, the myth of the flat earth was propagated by historians who knew better, but who wanted to see Christianity reduced to the equivalent of Santa Claus and the state to be supreme. This is obviously the reason why the myth of the flat earth was propagated in American schools to the extent it has been. It's unbelievable. There's a reason why they felt like they needed to bludgeon the Christian worldview down into submission, especially the concept of creation. The reason was the obvious. Science was derived from a Christian worldview. It required a Christian worldview in order for science to develop. And science has never been the enemy of the Christian faith. All the great names of science, and you can just rattle them off. Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, Kepler, Faraday, Pascal, Pasteur. The greatest names of science came out of a Christian worldview. And you have to really distort history to say otherwise. So just who would want to discredit creationists badly enough to actually distort history? Dr. Faulkner says this was done by people who wanted to make atheism look good. Now, you have to ask the question, well, why did this mythology about our belief in flat earth until recently came about? And it really started after the so-called enlightenment of the 18th century. That started in France. And this sort of movement made atheism and agnosticism respectable. It even caused skepticism. People began to attack religion in general and Christianity in particular. And these uh, began to come to fruition in the early 19th century. By the time you get to the late 19th century, there were two men particularly that play a role in this. One was John William Draper, and the other one was Andrew Dixon White. And through a number of essays and, and special speeches they gave, and then uh, each of them wrote a book on this long warfare, supposedly between religion and science, scientific advancement particularly. And this gave rise to a whole idea called the conflict thesis. And the idea was is that religion had continually inserted itself and held back and hindered progress in scientific development. And so they used as one of their major exhibits this whole thing about Columbus. And in the 19th century, they created this entire myth that Columbus had to fight against religious bigots and figures of darkness. They described that the sailors aboard a ship were on the point of mutiny because they thought they were going to reach the end of the world. And, of course, that's nonsense. Unfortunately, during this time, Christians also got tangled in this web of deceit and even still today do not realize they have been led to believe a lie. White and uh, Draper attempted to cow and intimidate the church into accepting evolution. And they made up the story and many others about the conflict of science. And basically the deal they offered the church was this. You folks really got it wrong with Columbus and the shape of the earth. And you got egg all over your faces. So here's your chance to get it right by getting in on the ground floor of Darwinian evolution. And unfortunately, uh, it worked. It was a lie. And it worked, nevertheless, so successfully that many Christians today repeat this error, this lie, without even knowing uh, that it is a lie and not knowing the history uh, of the lie. So I find this whole thing very offensive. Whenever I encounter this sort of thing, I uh, very quickly want to refute that. And one of the best resources for this was a little book written about 15 years ago by a man named Jeffrey Burton Russell. And the title of his book is Inventing the Flat Earth. For the most part, the public has still not been educated about this flat earth myth, even though it hasn't been a secret to historians. John Rica. Well, it turns out historians have known for about a hundred years. Writing started in the early 1900s about the flat earth myth, and it was generally understood that this was a historical falsehood. Perhaps the greatest scholar on Columbus in the last hundred years, Samuel Eliot Morrison, was aware of the flat earth myth perpetuated by Washington Irving and basically called it nonsense. The best scholarship at the time was beginning to realize that these were made up scenes and never part of truly what happened at the time. This has taken a long time to percolate into the general knowledge of the public and even today we can do a radio program on this and this amazes people because I believe most Christians still think that this is a truism. Because people have believed the historically inaccurate flat earth myth, creationists are still being compared to the so-called ignorant, unscientific people of old who believed in a flat earth. It's an easy thing to do today to paint with a broad brush and to disparage particularly creationists 
and other people who believe in the Bible as being so ignorant that they believed in a flat earth. And it conjures up the whole history that people feel they know about Columbus and sticks us at least 500 years behind modern times, instantly, in one sentence. But as Bill Hosh tells us, try as they might, evolutionists have not been able to discredit creation science, nor the creationist worldview. We have all of science behind us. When we believe that the earth was created in the not-so-distant past, that God fashioned organisms after their kind, and that there's limits to change in biology, that there was a global flood that was responsible for the fossil record in large part, and that there was a recent dispersion of peoples upon the earth. This is all very credible to anybody who's thinking critically. So what is the bottom line for the reasoning behind the flat earth myth? Why do people want to dismiss Christianity and the Bible? Bill Hoche. If it's true that there is a God who created us, and if it's true that, that man is in a state of rebellion against his creator, who is, happens to be a holy God, it is the most natural thing for man to do to run away as fast as he can from God's holiness. It really is a natural response. So I'm not surprised at all when I hear of claims of evolution that does away with the creator of the Bible, when I hear a pejorative kind of statements like Christians used to believe in a flat earth and the Bible teaches a flat earth and all this kind of stuff is meant to discredit Christianity. It doesn't surprise me that there's a big campaign on like this. But the good news is this. You see, your sins and mine, in other words, all of us, we have all transgressed a holy God. We have offended his holiness by our sins. And the good news is that instead of being punished for our sins, which is what we all deserve, he's given us a choice. And so it leaves man in the very humble position of saying, yes, thank you very much for that finished work of salvation on my behalf. It takes an act of receiving Christ as your personal Lord and Savior to ask him to forgive your sins, and that way you can have a hope of going to heaven after this world.